All right, who watched Batman the Animated Series when it was first on? <laughs> Almost all of them. This is very cool. All right, so we are here to celebrate the 25th anniversary. I'm not going to dilly-dally around. We're going to get right into it. So let's bring out our panelists. Um, she is Bubbles. She is Ben 10. Timmy Turner. Twilight Sparkle, Raven, Harley Quinn, and for all, oh heck, in Kim Possible, she played Tara. Uh, <laughs> but for today's purposes, she is Batgirl. Welcome, Tara Strong. All right, I know you guys remember this guy from Search for Tomorrow. Ooh, there's a camera right here. How about eight episodes of Dynasty? See him in that? <laughs> Captain Rusty Wallace in Tour of Duty? All right, how about, uh, he is the knight, he is a, what, what are you again? Come out and tell us, would you? Kevin Conroy! <laughs> All right, the understatement of the world here is the one of the greatest animation writers in history. If there is a fanboy hall of fame, he will be a first ballot contender. He is the greatest writer, producer. You'll love him. He is just retired, so we are giving him a send-off, although we'll probably have him back soon, uh, uh, to, to, to end all send-offs. Please welcome Alan Burnett. <laughs> And quite simply, the architect of modern superhero animation, Bruce Tim. <laughs> In front of you, just so you know, are uh, these nifty hats. I'm sure you do. The funny part is, they only made 50 of each of them. Wow. 25th anniversary of oh. Batman the Animated Series, 25th anniversary of Harley Quinn. Mm. I might have a couple of extras that I'm keeping and selling on eBay. All right, so Batman the Animated Series premiered on September 5, 1992. 189 episodes. I thought you said years ago. 189 oh. years ago. <laughs> no. Uh, what was it? We're going to get right in. Was, was it an easy or a difficult sell to the studio or uh, the network for the to make this? I mean, you. It wasn't a hard sell. Uh, I'm not exactly sure of, of what channels it all went through, but it was definitely a conversation with our boss, uh, Gene McCurdy, and uh, Margaret Lesh, who was uh, the head of Fox Kids way back in the day. So um, everybody wanted it to happen. Uh, I don't know exactly what Gene's pitch was to them, but it was uh, very easy because we were coming on the tails of the, the first Tim Burton Batman movie, which was a mega, mega su success. So. Uh, yeah, they, they wanted it, we wanted it to do it, and I think there was a lot of negotiating just in terms of, uh, you know, money and stuff, who was gonna get what, but uh, it took a little while to get that all nailed, nailed down, but then uh, we were go. Fo oh, actually, Fox News wanted Tiny Toons, my understanding, and so we, uh, they, they, put, uh, they brought together a package of several shows that Fox had to take to get Tiny Toons, and one of them was Batman. Uh -huh. So telling the secrets, I'm retired. We were the I, ugly stepchild. <laughs> well, I'm curious, you, you had 
only really been a character designer up till then, right? I mean, had you had? Uh, any I had done. Yet? I had done a little bit of everything. I had done uh, some storyboard work and layout design and background design and character design. Uh, but yeah, I had never been. I had actually directed a couple episodes uh, of Beanie and Cecil uh, <laughs> for John Chris Falusi back in 1988. But other than that, I had never been anything like a showrunner. So yeah, this was my my first time like being in charge of a whole show, and it was like. It was pretty terrifying. <laughs> did, you, did you automatically know? Did Mr. Burnett chime in? Eric, Paul, what? what, uh, what? It took a little while to assemble the dream team. I mean, when, when we first started, it was literally myself and Eric Radomski. Uh, as, uh, that was, we were the entire crew. And then we got their green light, and we had to like staff up uh, and start making air dates. Um, so we assembled the crew, the directors, uh, the writers. Uh, Paul Dini was uh, doing a little bit of work for us, but he was... Oh, you heard of him, huh? That's right. Yeah, you heard of him. Um, he was kind of straddling the fence. He, he was really wanted to stay on the Tiny Toons show for season two, and then he kind of was really int intrigued about doing the Batman show, so he, he didn't fully commit until this gentleman was hired and put in charge of the, the story department, and then he twisted Paul's arm to come on staff as a staff writer. He's, uh, I, I said, Paul, don't you want to do, don't you want to do something? Try, you know, you have some story ideas, don't you? Because he'd been thinking about it. He, I guess, co-wrote the Bible, right? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and he said, well, I don't know. I said, just give me something. So, you know, and he, a couple days later, I'm in my office. It's like, it's like six o'clock at night. And I'm just starting myself, so I'm trying to figure out, do, <laughs> do we have the show? And he gave me a two and a half page outline, which was Heart of Ice. Mm. And I remember, uh, he just handed it to me like, oh, this is no big deal, I'm okay. And he goes away, and I'm reading it at night, and I'm like, oh my God, this is, it. I called the network up and I said, I, I have the show. I mean, I have, uh, this is exactly what I wanna do. Everybody wants to do, and we have we had like the core script. I felt, and then uh, Paul stayed on, and uh, and thank goodness because he's just a, a genius writer. It, he is. Did not having been a producer before did that liberate you a little that you didn't know what you couldn't know? Mm. I mean, was that? A uh, little bit. I mean, it was interesting because what we were doing with the show was, uh, I know it kind of seems obvious in retrospect, but there was a lot of things about the show at the time were revolutionary, both in terms of the tone of the show that we wanted to do and some of the, just even the, the, the technical aspects of production. We had a lot of people who had worked, you know, in, in the technical aspect of the show for like, you know, decades at places like Hanna-Barbera, and we would come up with a, something that we thought would be an interesting, you know, way of adding production value to the show. like. If we had a big crowd scene, instead of you know, putting a bunch of flat animated characters there, we said, well, why don't we paint those characters onto the background? And these people who had been working at Hanna-Barbera for like decades said, oh, you just can't do that. It's just, it's not done. And we're just like, I don't care, we're gonna do it. You know, so um, uh, it was, you know, being brand new, we didn't, Eric and I didn't have, uh, Eric Radomski, my, my co-producer on the show, um, we, didn't have, we didn't have a track record, so a lot of people thought they could just kind of steamroller us, you know, and get what they wanted, and we kind of had a vision for the show that we wanted to do, so we had to, like, fight back really, really hard because, you know, we, we kind of thought we knew what we were doing, even though we really had no idea. So um, it was both challenging and terrifying and exhilarating all at the same time. How did you guys land on Shirley Walker? Shirley Walker, uh, yeah, God bless her. Sorry, Shirley Walker did the music for the one person in the room that doesn't know. Yeah. Um, we, uh, all having been impressed by the, the Tim Burton Batman movie, uh, I think a lot of things that um, we all kind of agreed on was that the, the music, Dan, Danny Elfman's music was like really kind of perfect. And, um, <laughs> While we were in production on our show, uh, the, the old Flash series, the live action series, was airing on CBS. And I watched that show, and I listened to the music, I thought, wow, that sounds kind of like Danny Elfman music. And then I saw this name in the credits, Shirley Walker. 
And uh, so I said, well, you know, we probably can't afford Danny Elfman, but I'll bet we could get this Shirley Walker person. <laughs> And uh, so through our, our music division at Warner Brothers, um, we, we put out a feeler for her to see what she was up to and what, what, what her deal was. And the, the word came back. They said, yeah, she actually worked with Danny on, the, on the, the Batman movie. So, and she's available. And yeah, she would love to work with you guys. So it was like, you know, like that. Easy. Alan, did the, did the scripts come easily? I mean, it would... Mm -hmm. No, I don't. Not well. When we started to find our footing, I think, yeah. uh, and that is uh, because of scripts. Heart of Ice. I was working on a uh, two-faced script, and we we sort of got down to a, a pre pretty serious Batman, which was what Bruce wanted to make and Eric wanted to make, and uh, and we were dealing with children's programs, but we were an afternoon show. So uh, a lot of the restrictions that you have on Saturday morning, we didn't have. And I, well, the smartest thing I did was to forget all the rules, just because yeah. I, couldn't, I couldn't stand them anyways. So, uh, <laughs> and so uh, that's what we did. <laughs> do, do you have an example, maybe an anecdote of some episode or a scene or something where you, you broke a rule or, or just went, went beyond the limits that you didn't know there were there? Oh, we, did, we, we kind of did that all the time. Uh, we, we didn't actually have a specific list of things we couldn't do on the show, but we, just from you know, the, the, the first couple episodes, you know, we kind of kept an idea in our heads like, oh yeah, we're not allowed to have characters go through a breaking glass window. Breaking We're glass. not allowed. Yeah, we had to minimize the guns, and we, you know, certain things. We couldn't do a headlock. You know, with certain kind of things that they said these are verboten. Don't ever do that. And I think eventually we did everything on that list, just about. <laughs> um, but uh, I mean, one interesting example. I mean, the, the the broadcast standards and practices people. They were actually. There were times when I, you know, would have big. Shout, shouting matches with them, you know, about things because we were constantly trying to like, you know, push the show, and uh, and they were pushing back, which that's their job. And ultimately, at the end of the day, they were great. They they, they let us do the show we wanted to do. But there was one episode uh, where uh, it was a dream sequence where Batgirl falls to her death and over the edge. You remember it, and uh, and she lands on the hood of Commissioner Gordon's car, and um, so. It originally was storyboarded as the camera was outside the car looking straight at the, the windshield and Batgirl falls into the frame and hits the, hits the roof of the car, or hits the, uh, the, the, the hood of the car. And they said, oh, no, no, you can't do that. That's, that's way too shocking. It's too violent. You've got to restage it somehow. And I said, okay. So I put the camera inside the car. And I kind of had a feeling that, yeah, if I could put like Commissioner Gordon's head and you know Bullock's head and kind of in between the viewer and you know Barbara Gordon's body hitting the car, they would think that that's toning down the violence, but it's actually making it worse because <laughs> we're sitting in the car with Commissioner Gordon when his daughter lands on the hood of the car. But sure enough, it went through and I kind of went. <laughs> so. So you bring up Batgirl. What, what was it about little Tara Cherdorf that, uh, that uh, said, ooh, th th we should, th anybody know that name? Okay, good. It took me a long time to get used to calling you Tara Strong. Because she's all grown up and she's Tara Strong now. Yeah. I said Tara Strong now. <laughs> okay, better. Uh, what was it about Tara that you guys said, bingo, that's Batgirl? You know, um, I don't even remember, did we, I must have, guess we must have auditioned. You, can, you must have come in to audition. Oh yeah, you were there, I was terrified. Yeah, yeah I'm sure. Because <laughs> we had had original, uh, originally it was, um, what's her, what's her name? Little, Little House on the Prairie. Melissa, Melissa Gilbert. Gilbert. Melissa Gilbert, I'm sorry, I'm going brain dead up here. Melissa Gilbert was our, was our original Batgirl. And then uh, when we came back and redesigned the entire show, uh, we kind of wanted a, a little di different take on Batgirl. So we went back and did auditions and there must have been something that she did that was just like perfect. But, um, but yeah, she was, she was delightful. So, Aww. so it wasn't like me. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Tara, what, what was that? You said you were terrified. What, uh, do you remember? You oh, obviously. well, we I, I'm sure you guys have heard, but when I was younger, I collected Batgirl. So um, I already lo loved her so much. And the idea of getting to play her and the levity of the role was just overwhelming. And plus the audition room 
was like all huge celebrities in the voiceover world and the on-camera world and it was so intimidating and um, when I went in I just did my best to be in the moment and, and, and really imagine myself as her in all these scenes. That's what we do. We just really immerse ourselves in these characters and when my agent called at the time and left it on my answering machine, he's like, oh my God, you're her, you're the bat, you're the girl that's the bat, you're bat girl. And I was like, oh my God, I was like freaking out. I mean, it was just so, I, I pinched myself then, I pinched myself in the studio with you guys at the wheel, with you and Hamill beside me. I still pinch myself when I get to play her, and it's just so amazing. And just as a side note, I've done many panels with these guys. I don't think I've ever heard your origin stories before on this show. <laughs> and it's so interesting to hear even you guys didn't know back then how amazing you guys were and weren't allowed to do anything you want to do or that you were nervous, because I always think of you guys as <laughs> such gods. So that was quite interesting, too, that they wouldn't just let you do whatever you wanted to do. That's a funny point. There was no internet back then. There was no, I mean, people wrote letters and how did you know you were succeeding? Uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, uh, well, the, <laughs> I mean, the ratings were good. Obviously that was the one thing we, we paid attention to was the ratings. Back then when we had ratings back, you know, the Nielsen's was like the thing. Uh, but, uh, you know, and, and going to cons, you know, we would go to cons and um, I remember the very first one we did before the show even aired uh, it was actually really exciting that people seemed, I mean, they were kind of like, you know, kind of listening to us. They weren't really sure, you know, they'd seen some of the designs for the show and I think they didn't, didn't really know what to think of it because it, you know, they were kind of simplified and cartoony and I don't know if that was what they were expecting. But I remember we had, during the slideshow, um, we had a slide of the Batmobile and they cheered. It was just like, of all things, the Batmobile. But it was like, so, you know, that was kind of a, the, the first hint that we were on the right track. Um, but then every time we'd do a show after that, every time we'd go to a convention, it was just, you know, the fans would just get more and more excited. So I guess that was, that was our internet, I guess. <laughs> there, there was no other show like it. And uh, to me, I thought it was long overdue mm. that to do a serious superhero show uh, in animation. It was, uh, it was a dream of mine to get involved in such a show. And when I saw the uh, trailer that Bruce produced, two-minute uh, fight with the thugs on a rooftop, it was like, it, 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 I just knew it was going to be a hit. Uh, and I wanted to be part of it. So, um, but there was no other show like it. it, it, it I, I thought it was going to be a hit from the beginning. <coughs> By the way, to this day, I still think there's no other show like it. I really do. Well, I shudder to ask because I think everybody's probably heard the stories one way or the other, but the, that guy at the end of the table, he... <laughs> Captain Rusty Wallace. Huh? Captain, Captain Rusty, Rusty Wallace, Wallace yeah. right? Tour of Duty. Yeah. Uh, tour of Duty. You were watching Tour of Duty at the time, and you said, we got to have him? I mean, no. he just came in off the street, right? Yeah, he came in off the street. We had, uh, during the original uh, casting sessions, we, I think we had spent like already like a week or two of casting, and we, Eric and I, were despairing of ever finding a decent Batman, because, uh, I mean, we, had, we cast, you know, unknowns and some famous people and... Uh, you know, including Flash Gordon and Buck Rogers came into audition. Um, uh, but uh, it, it just, nobody was even close. We had a very specific idea in our head, you know, and, and nobody was just, nobody was even coming close. So late in the casting uh, audition set, uh, this guy comes in and first of all, Andrea and, and Kelly Foley, who was our, our uh, note taker, uh, they both, they, he comes walking in the booth and they went, ooh, we want this guy before he even said anything. <laughs> and, uh, and we're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, and he opens his mouth and he starts reading the, 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 the script and he's like, we're done. Thank God, we got him. This is our Batman. And it was like, it was as, as simple as that. I think, I think a lot of it had to do with the fact that you were willing to look 
beyond the normal pool of voiceover actors. You were looking sure. at everybody for all oh, those yeah. roles. And because I would normally have never been brought in on something like that. I had never, literally never done an animated character. This is the first audition I ever had for an animated character. It was for Batman. Amazing. That doesn't happen. No. <laughs> that just doesn't happen. I mean, I had done commercial voiceovers when I was doing theater in New York as a way to supplement my theater income. And I, I happened to be in LA shooting a, a short, very short-lived series. And um, my voiceover agent said, well, they're putting together a new animated show over at Warner Brothers. Why don't you go and give it a shot? They're doing Batman. I said, new? No, Batman's been around forever. He said, no, it's never been an animated show of Batman. I didn't even know that. That's how naive I was to the whole <laughs> Batman universe. So I went in and I met Bruce and he said, well, what's your background on Batman? I said, well, no, I know the Adam West show from the 60s. He said, no, no, no. <laughs> we love Adam West, but that's not what we're doing. You know, erase your brain. <laughs> and he described this noir, dark, tragic childhood in this <laughs> world. <laughs> you know, this, this world that we're gonna create and um, he was describing this tragic, tragic character living in the shadows and avenging his parents' deaths. And I said, you're describing, you know, a classic, a classic tragic hero. You're describing like Hamlet or Orestes. And I remember Bruce said, well, no one's made that metaphor, but if that's, you know, helps you, then go with it. So I think it, I've always said, I think it was just sort of a hand in a glove situation. I had no expectations. So I had no nervousness. It was one of the most liberated auditions I've ever given because I had no preconceived notions. I didn't know who Bruce Tim was. I didn't know any of these people were. I had no, you know, you go into auditions, there's always all this tension you bring with you because you're, you anticipate what you want so much. I didn't know what to anticipate because I really didn't know that much about the character. I went in and I winged it and it was totally an improv. It was an improv situation yeah. and it, it, it was, it was like, it was just the perfect situation for me. I would be remiss if I didn't ask about <laughs> the other person that, whose presence is here that, uh, that is retiring, Ms. Andrea Romano. Mm. What was, what was she? <laughs> Andrea has no, uh, superhero knowledge per se. She's not a comics reader or, no. or the, along those lines. What was she like in the casting side? And then you guys tell me what she was like on the, uh, on the other side of the glass. I mean, I was I'll, I'm almost embarrassed to, to say, but I was almost uh, reluctant to use Andrea on the show because I hadn't, I'd never met her before. Uh, I knew that she had um, casted and directed the, uh, the first season of Tiny Toons which, you know, it was real high energy, cartoony type show and stuff. And then I met with her and Andrea is really high energy. She talks really, really fast. She's very, very excitable and everything. And I kind of thought, man, I don't know. You know, it's like, I, I, I have a very serious, you know, almost realistic, almost a, a radio show kind of, kind of feel in my head for what I want the show to sound like. And, and just based on Tiny Tunes, I thought, wow, is that, are we gonna get that? But so I explained, you know, Eric and I both explained to her, you know, kind of the, the sound we were going for. And she said, she said, oh, okay, I got it, I got it. Yeah, that's, let's, let's, you know, let's give it a, let's give it a shot. Um, and thank God. I mean, I really didn't have a backup plan as I didn't know any other casting directors. So, um, so we went through the casting process, the audition process with her, and she was great. And uh, she understood exactly what we wanted and um, had, a, you know, had all kinds of contacts in the, in, in the business. So she, you know, she knew lots of different um, actors. She, she knew that the people, both voice actors like, like, like Tara, and also she had connections at places like William Morris. So anytime we wanted to like stunt cast and bring in like live action people, she had those connections as well. And she was just, she was just awesome. She knew um, exactly how to get what we wanted from the show, so. She knows how to talk to actors, which Absolutely. is great. And she knows how to put things in actors' language mm -hmm. to get the performance out of them that you want. If you just give an actor a line reading, it's a shortcut to getting what you want, but it'll always sound like they're mimicking what they just heard. Yeah. You know, it'll never sound organic. And she has a way of guiding you into organically finding what they want you to do. And that's a trick, and it's a talent. And it's because she studied as an actress when she started out. 
She worked as the stage manager. She worked as an actor's agent. She worked in lots of different aspects of the business before she ended up in, in casting for, for voice work in animation. So she really likes actors and she mm -hmm. understands the way actors think. And, and actors sense that. And so you feel very comfortable with her and you trust her and you, you give really good performances because of that. She gets great performances out of people. Absolutely. Because Definitely. it's a very safe place. The, the, the recording studio is like a safe zone. And I've worked in situations when it's not, when you feel threatened by people in the room or when you feel like you're being expected, something is being expected of you. So there's a real tension in the room. Not, not with Andrea's room. It's always a very freewheeling, fun, creative atmosphere. It gets a little crazy sometimes. Well, see, I was going to say, that's, that's good. That's but the one that's thing. Good. Sometimes it can get crazy, but and she, but she knows how to be the mom when she needs to be she as well. She knows how to crack the whip. But and she be... used to let me go crazy. Sure, of course. Because she knew, and she came up to me one day, and she said, I know what you're doing, and I know why you're doing it, and, I, and we appreciate it. Because I would cut these jokes up every now and then sure. during the recording. And I do it intentionally because I was the only common thread through all these episodes. Mm -hmm. And after a few weeks, I realized, oh, wait a minute, I'm the only one who's in everything. And a lot of these people they're casting, because they were looking beyond voice people, they were bringing in television and film people who'd never done voice work before, yeah. for whom it was the first time. And so they were nervous. And they didn't know what was expected of them. But if they see the guy who's playing Batman do something really goofy or make a fool of himself and, and Bruce Tim cracks up about it, mm -hmm. suddenly the, the ice is broken yeah. and the guest star thinks, oh, oh, I get it. I can have fun here. Yeah. And Andrea said that to me. She said, I know exactly what you're doing and it's the right thing to do. Yeah. And, and we, we know what you're doing. We're letting you get away with it. Yeah, but the point I was making was that sometimes it would get a little out of control sometimes, yeah, not know. with you, but with other people. That's uh, accurate. And, but she, she has a, a wonderful way of, like I said, being stern and, you know, getting, getting down to business and getting the show done, but without being mean. Yeah. You know, it's like, it's the same way, even when she's, I mean, <laughs> I won't name names. We've had certain actors who just couldn't get it. There was like some big names that, that were like live action people who just weren't used to you know, uh, doing just voiceover work and people that we were really excited to work with and they came in and they were just awful. I mean, I hate to say it, but just awful. And, um, but she would work with them really, really hard and you know, she would try every trick in the book and just couldn't get it. And she would still not like, you know, what's wrong with you? She wouldn't like, you know, no, go off on no, him or anything. No. She was really, really sweet. She would handle him really well. And have, the couple times when we, she knew that we'd have to recast somebody, she would just turn around and say, I'm not gonna beat this guy up, but we're just gonna let him go. Yeah. It's like, yeah. Totally. And she'd always at that point say, great, wonderful, yeah. beautiful, you were perfect. God, thank you so much. Okay, everybody, you're broken for the day. Uh, g goodbye, everybody. Uh, Kevin, could you come here for a minute, just <laughs> yeah. for a few minutes? And I go into the booth, she'd say, what are you doing now? Are you free? And I'd say, yeah, I've, I don't have anything else to do. She said, good, because we have another actor coming in to read that role, and we need you to read them through it. And I'd say, but you told everybody they were so great. And she said, what, yeah. am I, what was I going to do? Tell them they sucked? You know? Yeah. It's so true, though, coming from a place of having acting experience. Oh, yeah. And there are so few directors like yeah. that. Oh, That's yeah. why we appreciate her so much. So often it's mm -hmm. someone that watched someone do it or was signing people in and says, I can do that. And it's like when they're line reading and you, as an actor, you almost feel like, especially people that do it all the time, mm -hmm. sometimes I get so frustrated and I'm like, I know how she would say this. Let me try it a few different ways. If you really don't get it, then they can say that to her. But yeah. having a real actor's director makes all the difference in the world. And yeah. also with Andrea, for me, even though she's high energy, she's real good at yeah. the realistic stuff. Like oh, yeah. my favorite superhero stuff is the dark stuff. Like I can't imagine doing Batman or the original Teen Titans with someone other than her because she really let us be in those real moments and picture them and envision them and she was always so supportive to the actor and like when you're in a booth like Kevin said she knew what to say to get what they were trying to get out of us and mm -hmm. sometimes you're in a booth with someone like can we get it more squiggly and we're like that's yeah. not our language that's <laughs> what an artist is drawing so right. it's so helpful to have someone that speaks our language and she really did yeah and the scripts too the way the scripts that bruce was coming up with i was so surprised at how um sensitive they were and how emotional they were how complicated they were i was looking at them from that perspective because 
the, the Batman character, what makes him so interesting is his complexity. He's a dark hero. He's a man with issues, <laughs> serious issues. And they never talk down to them. They never mm -hmm. talk down to the audience. And they never talk down, they never, I don't think you ever really talk down to, to what Batman was going, Bruce Wayne was going through. I mean, I mean the secret there is- There were some really heavy scenes. We weren't there. making the show for children. I mean, No, you weren't. I mean, uh, I mean, we were always aware that the show had to be, you know, family friendly, that the kids had to be able to watch it without being, having nightmares for the rest of our life. But honestly, we made the show that we would have loved to have seen when we were 12 years old. So yeah. that's exactly yeah. what we were doing. I mean, I've used this metaphor before, but in, in Mask of the Phantasm, there's a scene that... Oh, I know. There's a scene that Bruce Wayne has because he realizes he's fallen in love with Andrea Beaumont, and he realizes what love is for the first time in his life, and it's something that he desperately wants to have. But he can't because of the vow he's given his parents his dead parents, and he goes to the Wayne family crypt to plead with them to release him from that vow. And he has this incredibly emotional scene alone begging his dead parents to release him. And it's, a, it's an amazingly adult, complicated, emotional scene to play. And I, I respected you so much for writing that and for letting me play it the way you let me play it. I mean, I was playing it, you know, like... Honestly. Honestly. Authentic. Absolutely honestly. Nothing cartoony about it. <laughs> Batman the Animated Series did uh, begat a few uh, movies directly off the series, uh, in particular, Mask of the Phantasm, now available through Warner Archive on Blu-ray. <laughs> plug, plug, uh, plug. Smooth. smooth. You like that translation? That was very slick. Um, very, very, was, very subtle. Very smooth. <laughs> Thank you very much. And if you'd like when I have, oh. Um, but we, you guys, was it fun breaking into the film? Did that liberate even more? Or was that even more difficult if you were used to 22 minutes? Uh, it was fun being able to do a, a, a longer length story and being, being able to uh, get a little bit more in depth with the characters and, and, and all that. Um, yeah, it was, it was fun. Um, I don't know. I mean, what was, what was it like for you and the writers, Alan, to, because I know you worked with all of our staff writers, our, yeah, we well, yeah. Michael and Marty and Paul. It was a very democratic script. I wrote, a, I wrote the outline story and then we split it up. And uh, um, the, the, the scene you're talking about was uh, Marty Pascoe's scene uh, in the uh, funeral. And then I did the first part, Marty's part. When the Joker comes in, Deanie's part. And in the end, uh, Michael Reeves. And these were my main story editors on the show. And, uh, and then, you know, they're, they're all, we're writing this fast. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it, there was a big deadline. So I wish I could have written the whole thing, but it couldn't happen. And then we would put all the parts together and I would do an edit. And uh, that's how that script came about. I was, um, we had done everything in, this, in, the, in the series except uh, given uh, Bruce a love story. Mm. And the time had come for that. So that's... That's how it happened. Well, thank you. One of my favorite memories is about a year later, I mean, it didn't do that well in the, uh, at, oh. uh, at the movies. It was, I only played matinees in Los Angeles, and we were all like, it's, but adults should see this. Yeah. But um, about a year later, I got a call from my boss, Gene McCurry, I was on vacation somewhere, and she said, you got to watch this and Ebert. She, they reviewed the show. They love it. And uh, sure enough, they had reviewed Mask of the Phantasm a year later. Siskel even apologized for, yep. for skipping it the first time. And that's one of my nice memories of working on that show. Yeah, that was fun. Yeah. He goes, two thumbs up. Two thumbs up. Did you guys have a favorite obscure character that you were able to bring to life? Um, 
it was fun for us to, to bring a lot of the classic Batman villains to life, like the Joker and Riddler and Catwoman. And, um, but one of the things that we were most intrigued to do was to bring characters from the comics who had never actually been in a cartoon before, characters like Ra's al Ghul. And um, <laughs> one of the, at that time, one of the, the current Batman um, villains who was, I, I thought, a brilliant addition to the rogues gallery because he seemed like a classic Batman villain, but he was brand new, was uh, the ventriloquist in Scarface. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> I, I think both of the, the, the Scarface episodes that we did are, are some of my favorites. I think they were both really great shows. But uh, yeah, he was a really interesting character. How about you, Alan? Favorites? I know, I stole well, one of your favorites. favorites. Oh, well, I, know, I know you love Scarface as well. Well, I just saw recently, it's like look, what was watching images move on black velvet. I mean, it's one of the most beautiful things you ever did. Hmm. So uh, uh, I like Perchance to Dream is the, is the story I like because it's, Bat, it's Bruce Wayne wakes up one day and he's, uh, he's, uh, his parents are alive. He's, uh, he's, his girlfriend is Selena Kyle. I mean, life is great. And, and there's another Batman out there. So, so he feels like, well, did he dream this all? And, uh, and it's a story I love because it, it, it could only be told by, uh, it could only be told by, it's, it, it, it's a it's, Batman story. It's a Batman story. It's no other superhero story. It's definitely a Batman story. Mm -hmm. So those are my, I have a lot of favorites, so, uh, yeah. and a lot of favorite moments, but those are two of them. And I, I loved, uh, in that episode, that was one of our chances to work with Roddy McDowell, um, who was yeah. a, a terrific actor. I was a huge fan of him from the Planet of the Apes movies, and he was also, I think, the only actor to play a major villain in the Adam West series and a major villain in, in our series, yeah. so that was cool. Because he was obviously, you guys remember, Bookworm, right? Yeah. So. But the cast you put together was incredible. I mean, Roddy McDowell, John Glover as another. Mm -hmm. John Glover was awesome. Yeah. Paul Williams. Mm -hmm. Oh, I love Paul Williams. Adrian Barbeau. Yeah, Adrian we got a, we got a cheat sheet here. Yeah, listen to this. Listen to this, li this list. <laughs> Melissa Gilbert, Roddy McDowell, Ed Asner, Ed Dick Godier, who was awesome. Tim Matheson, Michael York, Robbie Benson. I forgot about that. Heather Locklear. That's right. <laughs> Malcolm McDowell, Mickey Dolenz. Elizabeth Moss, that's right, a long time ago when she was very, very young. She was a puppy. Yep. Loretta Swit, William Catt. Elizabeth Montgomery, oh my God. Oh, she yeah. killed me. Um, Paul Winfield, Adam Ant, <laughs> Adam West. Yeah, it was awesome. This was a terrific cast. And of course. You, you left one name off the bottom there. Yeah. Our friend Mark Hamill. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, him. That guy. Yeah, that guy. You know who else you brought in? You, Brian Stokes Mitchell did an episode. Do you remember that? Yep. yep. Yeah, I totally remember that. I had no idea who he was, and he's like, hey, you want to come see my show tonight? And I said, okay. And I brought my boyfriend at the time, and we had, like, second row center. I'm like, oh, this guy's got some pull. Like, I had yeah, yeah, yeah. no, and he, he was a star. It was ragtime. I was like, oh, my God. He was yep. so brilliant. Yeah. That was fun. Kevin, you got to... Uh, we were treated to a little, a little uh, musical uh, ordeal with you in, in, at WonderCon, and I know you like to sing. Can you recall that singing, uh, that opportunity you had to <laughs> sing in the series? Who? You? you? Me? Yeah. Well, that was on what Justice League. What are you talking about? Oh, that was Justice League. <clears throat> Am uh, I blue? <laughs> there was a time. I was her only one, but now I'm a sad and lonely one, lonely. Oh my goodness. All right, there's about 3,000 of you out there, and I'm assuming you have a couple of questions. We've got a couple of microphones. <laughs> Wait, everybody kill each other? What happened there? I know. Okay, so listen, a uh, uh -oh. couple of rules. Question. One, we, got we have a couple of presents. I'm not telling you they're gonna give you their hats, but I might have maybe two of them spare to give out, because these guys might wanna take their hats home. 
We have, and these are all courtesy of Warner Brothers Consumer <laughs> Products. We have this lovely statue of uh, Harley Quinn that Kara will pre pre present to the winner. She's cute. She's like saying, hi, you puddings, right on the box. <laughs> I might have two of these hats hiding, and then the entire uh, dais here has signed this DVD box set collection. Yeah, all four of them right there autographed, so we've got the plastic over it, you can't see them. This will be the last time we give away a DVD box set because next, next year, next year we're, uh, sometime next year, Warner Brothers Home Entertainment. Smells like discipline. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Next year, sometime later in the year, we are going, Warner Brothers Home Entertainment is going to release a remastered Blu-ray set. <laughs> and you are the first people to hear about that, yeah. so we'll also send you all an email when to pre-order, so stick around. All right, when you get to the microphone, your job is to say your name. We don't need to know where you're from, but you're gonna say it anyway, because this is New York. And, uh, and tell us your favorite episode of Batman the Animated Series. Go. Oh, okay. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name's Kevin. I'm from New Jersey. <laughs> New Jersey. Let's see. I'm figuring my favorite episode is probably Mad Love. Oh, it's a good one. Um, I was just wondering if, uh, if all of you guys could choose a role in uh, the Batman animated series. Is there a certain villain or a certain, like, or being Batman himself that you guys would relate to or want to uh, play in the show? <laughs> well, I'd like to give Joker a little try. <laughs> Ooh, Batty. That'd be fun. <laughs> 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 Yeah, right, it could be oh, you. Yeah, there you go. Cool. I am the knight. <laughs> <laughs> I am. <laughs> what do you think? I, I'm See, good. I would have beat you if I was there. <laughs> All right, how about over there? Hi, how are you guys? Well, we're good. pretty good today, but we're almost done, so we're going to have some dinner and then a movie. <laughs> <laughs> so my name's Michael. I'm from both New York and New Jersey. So go New York, go New Jersey. Um, my favorite episode of the series is what I want to discuss with you guys. The episode I Am the Night, along with Batman Mask of the Phantasm, really questioned the way Bruce really, Bruce really questioned why he was doing what he was doing. And in my own personal life, I always wondered what I was doing, why am I doing this? So my question to all of you guys is, I hope you guys don't think I'm making this, you know, but was there ever an episode of the series that, made, that reminded you of a time that you may want to forget? Wow. An episode that we would want to forget? No. No, an episode that reminded you of a time in your life oh. that you wanted to forget. Ooh, well, for right. actors, you know, they always say that actors are their instrument. We are our instrument. And it's, it's, there's a lot of truth to it because everything, you are the summation of your life. Every, all of your life experience is all that you can draw on to, to, to do acting. And, and the more connected you are with your past, the better an actor you are, the more of a channel you are. And I had a very complicated relationship with my father. It was very frustrating. He was a very difficult man. And um, I ended up taking care of him when he was an old man. But he, a lot of it was, I, I carried it later in life. It was just very frustrating. So when the, the a lot of the drama of, of Bruce Wayne and the, um, of, of his parental relationship, uh, I definitely used my own mm drama to feed into that. Um, that scene at that grave, the reason it means so much to me was because when I was playing it, um, I was putting my heart and soul into it. I was really there. Um, and, yeah. okay. But, I mean, we, we, we are, um, we are instruments of our emotions for, for acting. I, voice acting isn't, putting on a funny voice. It's 
it's embodying a whole character. The reason Tara's so brilliant at Harley Quinn isn't because she can do a high squeaky voice. A lot of women can do high squeaky voices. It's she gets into this crazy, crazy head of this woman. It's just this complicated whack job, <laughs> you know? Those sessions are such good therapy for myself. I bet, I bet. <laughs> I just get to work it all but out. But the audience hears that, <laughs> you know? You hear that and you relate to it. And it's not just a squeaky voice, it's this crazy, crazy broad. Um, <laughs> No? It's so true. I mean, it's true. I, when I was doing Arkham City, I totally cried when the Joker died. Yeah. Totally cried in the session, like uncontrollably crying for him. Aww. Yeah. What? <laughs> Listen, if you don't know that by now, you're in the wrong panel, okay? <laughs> <laughs> I don't have an episode that made me sad or regret my life, but I have a favorite, which I always love girls' night out. Mm. I, oh. I love the animation. Like, I just love the idea of two chicks being so kick-ass together. And it really was before there was a sort of celebration of powerful women in animation. Mm. And we got along really well at that session, and I think that showed um, in the acting beats, and it was so much fun. Like, they're just sitting around in towels on their heads, like, and chilling out. Like, let's go to the spa, Supergirl. Like, it was just so real, but then there's obviously a lot of depth to them, too. I loved that episode. It was so fun. It was a given. <laughs> All right, how about over here? All right, thank you. So, my name is Aaron, I'm from Mexico, and my favorite episode is uh, Robin's Revenge. I used to love, you know, the two-part episodes, so that one was great. Reckoning. That one, yeah, one. That from one. Mexico. I watched it in Spanish, so, you <laughs> yeah, know, they sure. changed the names <laughs> a little bit, and you know that. What is the episode title in, in, Mex in, uh, in Spanish? La Venganza de Robin. Oh, there you go. And of course. There you go, it's pretty much, more or less. Same episode. All right, so, uh, first of all, chronologically, Alan, thank you, because the first Batman, when I was four years old, three, I mean, four, five years old, was the Super Friends Batman, yep. and that got me there, and, you know, plus, of course, Batman 66. And then, uh, Tim, thank you, I've been trying to get a picture of you, or just to say hi a few minutes before, Hey, Tim, give me a hi. So thanks for that. I mean, it doesn't matter. Uh, but thanks for the work. I mean, I really love it. Uh, I'm, going, I'm going faster now. So you had a vision, right? And you changed everything. Is there any vision that you have now, uh, Alan or Tim, uh, Tim at this point? You know, that would be my question. No, thanks. I'm done. <laughs> I'm out of visions. No, I'm kidding. Uh, you know, um, you know, we, you know, we're, I mean, Alan's done, for real. He's really done. He's really retired. <laughs> well, I've, I've been at Batman for 30-something yeah. 30 30 years. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I'm, I'm still at Warner Brothers myself, and still, I mean, right now I'm, I'm uh, um, doing a series of directed video movies with the characters, not just Batman, but, but Superman and the Justice League characters. So, um, and uh, our next movie is actually coming out early next year, Batman Gotham by Gaslight, which is a really different... <laughs> really different version of Batman, so uh, hopefully you guys will all come out and see that. And, um, but yeah, I'm, I'm gonna be doing Batman for, you know, for the foreseeable future. Awesome. Well, thanks again, everybody. Thank I'll you. Look. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Over that way. Hi, uh, my name is Monet. I'm from Brooklyn. Um, Hi, Brooklyn's in the house, okay. Um, so my, my favorite episode is Harley's Holiday. It made me realize how much I love crazy. So hi, Tara. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> and my question is, um, do you guys think that the work that you did um, on the animated series laid the groundwork for the current um, darkness that the current Batman is able to, you know, be in, and I'm wondering um, if you do think that you guys laid the groundwork for the current darkness of Batman, what do you think about that? Um, well, you know, it's interesting. We certainly wanted to have a level of quote unquote darkness, uh, you know, but our version, our version of that is more, more of an atmosphere of mood and mystery. It's not so much, you know, dark, grim, angst. Um, so we, we always tried to balance the, the darker aspects of the show with fun and with adventure and humor and stuff. So we always wanted to have, you know, a complete package. So uh, I, whether, 
where we're to blame for Batman being really dark now. I don't know. Um, but, uh, I mean, we certainly uh, weren't the first ones to take Batman to the dark side. But We, we pretty much went through all the Batman comics mm -hmm. and took what we wanted from the comics, the stuff that we loved the most. And uh, that was our attitude about the show. Uh, we wanted to uh, have a, 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 an animated series that was like an animated comic book. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and he's, yeah, he's gotten dark. I, you know, I have a story to tell. Okay. okay. It's a little off the subject, but it just occurred to me. We might find it interesting. When we were just first starting Batman, and it was the first year of recording, and we were recording at a Glendale studio, which had a big wall around it covered in ivy. You wouldn't know. Soundcastle. A soundcastle. Mm -hmm. And uh, we recorded a show, and I was uh, the last one there. I was collecting scripts or making notes or doing something. Everybody had gone. It was quiet. It's like 8 o'clock at night. And the guy next, the engineer comes to me and says, Hey, Alan, do you want to meet Bob Kane? And I oh, said, wow. Yeah. <laughs> and he uh, took me uh, across the parking lot. It's dark. And we're, we're going into another studio. And I go in the door, and he's leading me. And I'm, I'm, I'm going through stalactites and stalagmites. There's a set here. And there sitting on a bat throne is Bob Kane. Wow. And, uh, and I uh, shook his hand. And he was very polite, he was very gentlemanly, and he knew what we were doing and everything. He was there to shoot some, some promo footage of some sort. And I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, you are, here you are, shaking hands with Bob Kane in a bat cave. <laughs> you have finally arrived. <laughs> wow. <That's> cool. <laughs> Thank you, Monet. That's great. Next. Hi, I'm Stephanie from Gotham, AKA New York. Mm. Uh, one of my favorite episodes is Harley and Ivy, uh, where you get to see the closeness and the nurturing nature of the relationship, which I thought was really cute and how badass they were with each other. Um, so my question was, uh, were there any characters or story arcs that you wanted to include into the series but weren't able to make the cut? Um, well, I have one. I know Alan has one. Uh, we never got past just the idea stage, but uh, I wanted to do uh, uh, an episode uh, where Batman becomes a vampire. <laughs> and, oh, yeah, uh, let's do it. Yeah, let's yeah. do it. And uh, uh, we, the, the word came back from Fox kids that no, no vampires, no vampires whatsoever. And uh, we said, but what if we, and they said, no. <laughs> so we didn't do that. Um, but then I know you had a story that was near and dear to your heart that we actually wrote the script for. Yeah. The script was all done. It was the story of the gun that killed Bruce Wayne's parents. And it, it, followed, it followed the creation of the gun and all the people who got that gun until the, the, final, the final killer used it. And uh, it was just too much for uh, Fox. But the script is on. Cool yeah. The script is in, in a, a, a DVD collection, or uh, it's attached to a DVD. I don't know which one, mm. but uh, it's there to read if you uh, can find it. Why don't you do that one before That's you cool really idea. retire? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh. it, it was such a, a fine script, cool. um, it, you know. But, you know, you, you get, you, I was happy to have done what I was able to do, as you exactly. are too. Over that way. Hi, my name is Ryan, and I believe my favorite episode, one of my favorites actually, it's hard to pick, would be Legends of the Dark Knight because it shows mm -hmm. like, you, you show many different versions of Batman oh. from the Adam West version to the Frank Miller version. Mm -hmm. And I just want to say, it, it's pretty clear from all the people in this room, your show has stood the test of time. I watch it today and it's still, it doesn't feel like I'm watching a cartoon. Um, <laughs> It, it, it really does feel like I'm watching a really good drama. Yep. And I'm just wondering, like, like, what is it that kept you so creative and let these scripts stand the test of time? And quickly, any plans to do anything with Batman Beyond? <laughs> uh, <laughs> what? 
Um, okay, so, so Batman Beyond, quickly. Oh, it comes up for discussion every now and then about doing something more with that. Uh, so that's a possible. There's nothing in, in the works at the moment, but you never know. Uh, and then the other question, mm, you know, I, did, what? <laughs> just do it? <laughs> no, just How many here want to see, see us do a Batman Beyond movie? <laughs> Hopefully our friends at uh, Home Video are watching this live stream. I think they, they heard you loud and clear. <laughs> they heard them all the way back in LA, are yeah. you kidding? Uh, <laughs> okay. I don't even know if we answered the question. I don't know, I don't remember How what the, what the question was. I don't know. All right, hi everybody. My name is Claudia from Queens. My favorite episode is the same as Tara's. And um, I was just wondering, what inspired the most memorable theme that we all know today? And uh, for Kevin, if you could please reenact that for us, it would be amazing. Most memorable theme? Uh, the, the main opening, like, I am vengeance. Oh, oh that. Oh, <laughs> oh, oh. oh she, wants to hear, she wants to hear it. Yes. And if he won't do it, I'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> I am vengeance. I am vengeance. I am the knight. I am Batman. <laughs> Let's hear from that side. Hi, uh, my name is Joshua. I'm originally from San Francisco. And uh, one, of my, uh, one of my favorite, well, actually, all of my favorite episodes are essentially anything that has the Joker in it. I absolutely mm. love that character. Um, so uh, my, my question was actually asked, but I had a backup. Uh, in the, uh, the recent adaptation of The Killing Joke, mm -hmm. what was the motivation behind so drastically changing the relationship between Batman and Batgirl? Oh, no prize for that man. Tara, you want to go out and okay, kick his Brian butt Azzarello right now, or not, what? Brian Azzarello's not here, so we'll throw him under the bus. <laughs> it was his idea. Oh, it was... I like that someone just answered in the audience, because it's hot. <laughs> <laughs> Who would have thought that that section would, would be the controversial the part controversial of that movie? The controversial part of that movie. And the reason we did, well, the reason we did a short in front of the movie, uh, in front of uh, uh, The Killing Jokes, because we didn't want to sort of touch The Killing Joke. There was no way to lengthen it. Right to 72 minutes, and, and if to do that would just be. So we decided to go another route. And people are, <laughs> people are disturbed. I'm not, but people are disturbed I wasn't by disturbed. That. So, were you disturbed? No, not even a little bit. <laughs> I quite liked it. Well, I mean, here's the thing. I mean, <laughs> I mean, the reason we wrote that scene the way it was was we, we intended it to be wrong. You know, I've, I, a lot of people think, you know, it's like, oh, we did it because we're shipping those two characters or something. But it's like, no, if you watch that scene, the music is telling you, oh, no, it's not sexy. This isn't like a love story. No, this is a tragedy that this is happening. So, you know, I, I don't know. But it seemed like a good idea at the time. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> and Batman Beyond, they've yeah. had a relationship. Yeah. So, so that's the reason. And it, it freaked people out then, too, Alan. I hate to tell you. That's, that's I know. But they're adults. It's the mentor. He was her mentor. But you know, people make mistakes. People make mistakes, big and ones. And that's drama, so. Do you think it was a mistake? Huh? Do you think it was yeah. a mistake? No. <laughs> <laughs> it was dark, and we were young. Call me. <laughs> Are we done? <laughs> How about right there? Bullet Club. Too sweet, yeah. Uh, my name is Matt from Long Island. Uh, my favorite episode is on Leather Wings, because I think it really set the groundwork. Sweet. And, you know, for the entire series, and, you know, you got Batman bleeding, which didn't happen a lot. No. My question is uh, for Kevin and Tara. 
how did you decide, like after the animated series ended and the DCAU ended, which I'm still bitter about, how did you decide what projects you would take? Like, Kevin, how did you decide, you know, someone would come with you to be like Batman, and how did you decide which projects to take, and did you turn any projects down? <laughs> Why is that funny? Because uh, Kevin's sitting down there going, turn down a project. Turn down a project. <laughs> Somebody's going to pay I'm me. I'm an actor. Either. Are you crazy? <laughs> I don't turn down projects. Um, no, I, everyone's, uh, no, I love playing the character of Batman. He's such a wonderful, complicated character. I. You were really born to play that part. I love playing this character. Yeah. And I hope. You are Batman. Yeah, 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 you are. That's right. I, I hope that the opportunities continue to come my way over time. I really do. But, you know, other things come up. Like, I am doing a new show now for uh, Nickelodeon that has, I can't tell you what it is, because it hasn't been announced yet. But I, I'm, playing a really, I'm playing a really crazy character. It's the total other end of the spectrum. And it's a, it's a crazy, wonderful character. And I'm really loving it. But um, no one knows about it yet, so. No, no hints, no hints. But you know, actors don't turn a lot down, let me tell you. You can tell them, they won't put it on the internet. No, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we'll just keep this between us. Right? <laughs> All right, we got time for two more questions. What do you got for me? Hi, um, my name is Dylan, and my favorite episode is um, Almost Got Him or the Baby Doll episode. <laughs> And I like to make a quick statement. Kevin, we already met, so um, a couple of while back I was in Guide Joker. Um, I'm diagnosed with autism, and um, the I feel like Batman, the anime series, have now their influence, not just my childhood, but saved my life, and I can speak down on behalf of everyone else. But my main question is, due to its pushy nature and everything, if it, Batman, the anime series, was made today, uh, would you get away with more or less than you already did? Mm. <laughs> That's a good question. Uh, we'd probably get away with a little bit more, probably. I mean, it depends. It depends who, if we were doing it for, you know, for a daytime show or, you know, a nighttime show. It's hard to say. But, you know, I mean, the, the standards have relaxed, I think, across the board in TV. So we'd probably, it would probably be a little bit more adult this, these days than it was back then. But I don't think it would have been any better than it was. I think it was pretty good the way it was. Thank you, Dylan. Last question, made it a, make it a humdinger. Hi, hi, I'm Ferris from New York. Um, my, uh, my favorite episode, I was gonna say Mad Love, because of how you can show the bending of a psyche in 22 minutes of storytelling, mm -hmm. but um, I, I will also say the episode where Poison Ivy gets her perfect family and then mm. yeah. also That's deals great. with very human things. So I was going to say a lot of the characters in the Batman world are figments of the human psyche. Is there any figment of the human psyche that you didn't get to deal with, whether it be a character that's already in the world or not in the series? Mm. No, I think we're good. <laughs> 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 Honestly, I don't know. I don't know. What about you? I don't know. And you don't care because you're retired anyways. <laughs> well, it's a, we did so always, much. I just, if fun. something occurs to you, just write it down and send it to us. Okay, I will. <laughs> <laughs> He's in Florida. He can call. He can text. You want him to scrip it down? And yeah, I want to stick it in the mail. Yeah. <laughs> I'm old school. <laughs> okay. Batman, the animated series 25th anniversary. Coming to you on Blu-ray next year. Uh, when we're done here, I need to see Michael, Monet, Steffi, and Dylan over in that corner. See where those two guys are walking? Stand over there and I'll give you something nice. We're not signing autographs. No, Back right, up. But it. first, you gotta say thank you to Kevin Conroy. Tara Strong, <laughs> Alan Burnett. Hey. I said, Alan Burnett, the man's retiring. <laughs> and Bruce Tim. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. We'll see you again next year with something fun. <laughs>